We're down in the Delta, very flat land, much like uh, the southern half of Arkansas. Lots of green rice paddies and uh, not a hill for 250 miles all the way from Saigon to Kamau. When we got new, brand new aircraft, we needed new call signs from what we had before. We had a meeting of the pilots that had been picked to uh, fly those aircraft, and one of them was a guy named Max Hall. He was a lieutenant, and Max was a graduate from the uh, University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. And he produced the red Razorback patch, and since no other uh, armed helicopter platoon had that uh, name, and it was a great looking patch, uh, we picked the Razorbacks to be our call sign. And that led to a big red pig painted on the door of each helicopter. And uh, that's when we started, June of 1964. We worked directly to uh, support the 7th Vietnamese Army, Army Division. And that was the first time that uh, U.S. helicopters could be called by a Vietnamese unit and go direct to them without having to go through a higher headquarters. Its mission starting from 65 was uh, Saigon security. At that time, we were the only armed aircraft in Jadian province, which was the Saigon area. There was no uh, no other American armed aircraft, even though Thompson was a large airfield, there was no no armed aircraft there. The VNAF had nothing there. It was just, we had uh, two fire teams of gunships to, for all air support within that area. Because they uh, decided that it was a pretty secure area. I think the closest other armed aircraft to us was Ben Wong. So our function was was to support of anybody that was in Jaden Province, and mostly that was Arvin or RF or PF forces. We had an alert shack in the middle of Thompson Hood Air Force Base on the runway, and we kept a fire team on it 24 hours a day, and we had five minutes standby. And we had another team that we kept that was at Hotel Three, and they were on 30 minutes standby. We would get scrambled out sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon, sometimes at night. Just whatever, whenever something happened, we got to go. Judgment of the fire team that was on station, we, they needed help, they'd call out the second fire team. If it was going to be an elongated time, the second fire team would move up to five minutes standby in case we had other problems. Usually a slick platoon will carry troops into battle. Well, this particular uh, slick company, the 120th, Salt Helicopter Company, they were, they did do that, the first part of their uh, duty in Vietnam, but eventually they were assigned duties, what they call them, strap hangers. They would carry uh, high-ranking officers from place to place. Uh, they would do medicaps to Vietnamese villages. They didn't do any combat assaults anymore, but the gunship platoon still did. The Razorbacks was the fourth platoon, which was the gunship and they functioned as a, any gunship platoon would. They were in Saigon, and the 120th was in Long Bend. You have two aircraft. You have two pilots in each aircraft. You have a gunner and a crew chief. And the way we were organized, we had the team leader in the lead ship, usually a lieutenant, he had a wingman, and we tried to keep the wingman and the team leader together so that they began to know how you're going to work, how you're going to turn. Uh, when we went in on a target where we fired, 
the first pair of rockets, the second pair of rockets told my wingman the targets in between those two pairs. You really get attached to the guy you can know that you can count on. It's not just pilots that get together. It's the pilots, the crew chiefs, the gunners, the maintenance people that worked on them. Most crew chiefs worked in a maintenance platoon until I learned about how to service the aircraft. Then they'd get a ship of their own. I was in maintenance there for about three months and I had an itching to fly. I wanted to, to fly more than I wanted to stay on the ground. So I got transferred to the 120th and then the, the second platoon Snoopies. I started flying General Westmoreland around. So about the next four to five months, I was General Westmoreland's ship down in four and three core. It seems to me that I wasn't doing my job. So I asked for a transfer to the gunships because I wanted to get in the mix. I started flying with Razorbacks for the door gun. My job was to maintain all the weapon systems on the aircraft. And when the, the helicopter flew, I would fly as a door gunner. I started running missions that way. Then later on, I had the chance to be a crew chief. Well, as a crew chief, you knew the aircraft. You know, you did daily inspections and made sure it was safe to fly minor repairs, greasing, you know, lubing, lubricating parts that moved and that kind of stuff. To me, the, the, to maintain that UH-1B, it takes constant attention. You do your daily, you're trying to spot problems to prevent problems from bigger problems. So you try to fix things, that way it doesn't break down and you you're airworthy to be able to fly and complete a mission. We're heroes. Just we had a job to do, and we did our job, and we helped save some people along the way. So, so be it. That's a byproduct. It got to be that that was a unit you extended for, or you did a second tour with. A little saying up on the wall. We tap it as we go out the door. It said that Razorbacks go where angels fear to tread. And I got to the point where I was believing that. When I got to Vietnam, I was assigned to the 1st Infantry Division. And after a period of time, I became a machine gunner, M60 machine gun, the same machine gun that's used in the gunships as door guns. Having lived a, a tour uh, hot and nasty and wearing the same clothes for weeks at the time when I'd see these door gunners come in to pick us up I noticed they wore clean fatigues and were shaving and all that and that looked pretty good so I thought I wanted to try that so when my tour was up I extended for this particular helicopter company 120th assault helicopter company I just wanted to be a door gunner but when I found out the difference in what the gunships did and what the slicks did I, I guess I wanted a little adventure, so I, I volunteered to get in the gunship platoon. The pilots, I mean, I, I had heard, and, and I assumed rightfully so, that probably the, the, the gunship pilots were gonna be some of the best pilots that the company had, just due to the nature of the missions they flew. Well, I had seen combat before uh, I came to the Razorbacks and, and thought I knew a lot about uh, about close air support or, you know, aerial gunnery. Um, but I really got, I really got my gunnery experience and my attack helicopter experience in the Razor Rags. The kind of missions we flew, 95% of them were hot missions. Somebody on the ground was in pretty big trouble. Well, they wouldn't have called us to start with. So when we get there, all the bad guys on the ground, they don't want to see us coming. They don't like us. They know who we are and they're trying to kill us, and we're trying to kill them before they can kill us. And it's just the mother of all adrenaline rushes. It was a defining moment of my life, truly. The infantry was too. Uh, that was, infantry duty was terrible, but I saw much more combat in the Razorbacks than I ever did in the infantry, and everybody, everybody else did too. Uh, there's just no way to compare. I mean, every time you went up, you faced certain death. And it wasn't like uh, you were going to do it, and you might not have to do it again for a month. I mean, you might have to do that two or three more times that day. 
And you get to wondering, you know, when is my luck going to run out? But all you can do is, I mean, where are you going to go? You don't want to disgrace yourself uh, by not being able to function and do what you're supposed to do. And you've got so much love and respect for the guys that you're with, you don't want to do anything that will make them lose their respect for you. That's who you're fighting for. It ain't mom and apple pie. It's the guys that surround you. You're doing it for them, and they're doing it for you. It was one of the, the things that I've, I've seen that, that I, in other units I never saw is that there's always a, a, a heck of a dividing line between the officer and the enlisted man. And in, in our unit, that line was pretty much melted. I mean, you knew he was the officer. He's in charge. But you could walk up to him and say, sir, we could change this and make this better or do that. And he says, let's do it. There was a lot of things that affected my life in a positive way. And, and one of them was the people that was in the Razorbacks that I got to work with. And I've made several friends that we've been friends for over 40 years. And uh, they're good people. They had some uh, high caliber officers in there when I was when I was in, you know, as far as leadership and and, and uh, their capabilities as a pilot. And and I learned a lot watching the way they lived their life. And it was some. It was a good example that you know that you can kind of pattern your life about what you do and what you don't do and when you do it and and that sort of thing. I was always surrounded with good people when I was over there. Never had to worry about them. Never had to watch my back. I always had somebody to watch it. I'd watch theirs, they'd watch my back. And uh, I don't think there's a lot of people that goes over there and comes back to say that. I had the opportunity to go to another unit when I extended, when I got wounded. I went to Okinawa and they asked me what I wanted to do while well, my ear was up in Vietnam. And when I recuperated, they said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I extended to stay in the Razorback. They said, well, you don't have to go back. Your year is over. And I said, well, I said, you know, I don't, I don't want to go anywhere else, you know. Uh, here again, now you look at it, and you felt comfort there. That was a safe zone. And that's where your buddies were. For months, Payne would go out there and shoot rockets off at pineapples. We couldn't figure out why, why are we wasting this ammunition, sir? Well, if that offensive hit, there was a person one that said, we wasted that. January 31st was my birthday. I was just turned 21. And so but my uh, helicopter was on Starcom standby over there. So so at uh, 03 o'clock in a.m. we got scrambled out and, uh, uh, and flew just constantly till around 8 o'clock that morning until we finally got peppered with uh, quite a few rounds. I don't know what to say about Tet. We flew for 24 hours a day. It seemed like about six weeks. It wasn't quite that long, it was a few days most profound experience I can remember was we scrambled out of Hotel 3 during Tet, started climbing up to see what was going on, and we kind of expected a uh, minor probe of the defenses, which is what usually you had out there, maybe a squad or a platoon-sized unit coming in. And all of a sudden I looked down and there was more green tracers coming up and we could put red tracers in. To the shop. It was, there was a lot of fire. For a while, they were running about a 15 minute turnaround from the time we took off at Hotel 3. Go empty a load, come back, and the, 
land, rearm, and take off again. And we we ran ran through a lot of rockets and a lot of ammunition there that night. And that kept going for all night. And the next day it became a lot more sporadic, but it was still pretty heavy. The next night it was still we were still going. Nobody had slept yet. We finally got to sleep about the third day. They brought a heavy fire team down from the 334th. They lasted six hours. They lost two helicopters, were down, and the third one so badly shot up they couldn't couldn't continue, and they had to call us back onto the flight line. We were supposed to have 24 hours off. All of us had been flying for at least three to four days at that time, and we had to go back out. None of us could sleep. We'd all been sent back to the barracks, and everybody went, well, we didn't, we didn't have anything to drink because we knew we were going to get called back. But we just didn't know when, but we couldn't sleep either because we were so uh, adrenaline loaded that we couldn't, you couldn't rest. During Tet, we had a lot of aircraft that got shot up. We started out with eight aircraft in the Razorbacks, eight B models. And in Redstone Maintenance, I think it was, the hangar right beside us and on Hotel 3, was civilian maintenance there. They had uh, eight B models that belonged to the Navy in there. They had just came into the country down at Nob Bay. Well, since we were getting shot up so bad, the people over there decided they'd go ahead and arm it systems on us on them because they didn't want Charlie overrunning Tonsonuk because they were on it too, you know. So we went, we had all hours shot up when none of them were left liable. And uh, we ended up with three of the others left liable, I believe it was, by the third day. If we hadn't had the maintenance facility beside us, they were putting aircraft back together as fast as we could get them shot up. We had people getting shot down all over the countryside. Most of the people that got shot down at that time got shot up. They didn't really literally get shot down and crash. They got shot up and managed to get back into either Hotel 3 or the runway at Thompson Oak. So we didn't have any aircraft going down outside the perimeter that I remember. Not during that first three or four days. Uh, after that, we did as it branched out and got further out, as they were retreated, moved further out of the city and moved out. We had some, we lost some outside the perimeter. Each had a, a certain revetment that we parked in. He picked up the first night, pulled up to a hover about 50 feet off the ground, and all of a sudden he started shooting rockets because that's how close they were. The airborne was right west of us. They'd overran them, and they were within 200 yards of our position. And then that, that night, they brought in the 27th Wolfhounds from the 25th Infantry Division. And those boys kept them off our backs. They were planted right on, the, on a berm right in front of our helicopters. For two days, they were sitting there before they moved out and started moving back to the west. But I mean, it was close, it was very intense. That intensity, I think, bonds people in a life and death type situation more than uh, anything else you can do. They went looking for enemy, and of course when Ted happened, there were lots of enemy, because there were three North Vietnamese uh, regiments that's about 1,500 troops apiece that were uh, given the mission to uh, take over Saigon during Tet. We were getting missions that, re that where they wanted us to hit a particular target that was, was a very precise uh, target and didn't want any collateral damage on either side of it. So, uh, you know, they give you an eight foot, eight by 10, side of a building that you could hit, but you couldn't hit anything outside that. The first mission they approved, we went downtown in uh, Cholon to an apartment building. And the, the Vietnamese Rangers were receiving uh, fire from an apartment house. So we rolled in on the target and uh, 
I fired the first pair of rockets and uh, uh, one of them came out and went sideways, went out to, at an angle and I fired another pair and they went into the target and I got a ceasefire in that rocket. Uh, there, there were a group of Vietnamese politicians uh, that President Tu had met with that day. He wanted them on the ground on the scene and this particular stray rocket uh, they were standing on the steps of a school building. The rocket hit over the doorway and they were standing below that and seven of them were killed. We had a series of investigations. The crew had to go through and testify. We were exonerated as we told them that this is an artillery type system. It's an area fire, not a, not a precision weapon. There are bad rockets at times and this was a bad rocket and uh, it was unfortunate. December the 12th, 1968. I was working on my aircraft. Uh, Tom Cooper come in and uh, I think his gunner was wanting to go do something real quick. And I just said, I'll, I'll cover for you if you go back out. And we got called back out. We'd been flying as a heavy fire team. We got about, oh, maybe three, four miles away from the troops. And we crashed. Nobody was hurt in a crash. It was a very bad area, and we knew that. We got out of the aircraft, and Everything was quiet. Took ammo and weapons out, set up a perimeter around the aircraft. We were right on the edge of a river. So the jungle was about 150 yards wide to the rice paddies. Popped a smoke grenade to mark our spot, hoping that the troops on the ground's commander would see it from the air. And as soon as we did that, fire from the enemy just broke out. It was just nonstop. After about 15 minutes, the one pilot, Michael Murphy, got up in a crouch and ran away into the jungle. The jungle was very thick, so you couldn't see very far. You couldn't, you couldn't see the enemy shooting at you. He got about 10 feet and was knocked down by enemy fire. Didn't answer our calls, and we couldn't get to him you know, because of the heavy fire. So we just kept shooting, kept calling for him. Davey Adams, a fire team leader, told me to go back in the aircraft, get on the radio and stay there until you get us some help. I was able to get a hold of the general's command helicopter of the troops. And he says, I'll contact somebody to get you help. And I was finally able to make contact with our other two helicopters. Said that they had us in sight, and that they had the enemy in sight and they were awful close. Told me they'd be rolling in and that we should keep our heads down because they'd be firing very, very quick. I shut everything off and crawled out of the helicopter. And by then, Davy Adams had been shot and killed right inside the aircraft. Now it was just me and Jimmy. It went on for another maybe 30 minutes. And finally, they had no enemy contact. The general's helicopter pointed towards the other side of the jungle area at 150 yards away to the rice paddies. And uh, again, I told Jimmy, I said, you go ahead, I'll cover you. So Jimmy took off. I watched him until I couldn't see him anymore. And, and I checked the two pilots and collected their dog tags and made sure they were, that they were both gone and uh, collected their weapons. And then I went to the, General's aircraft. Way we went, you know. we flew around and watched him put his troops in, and watched him go to the aircraft, and then they took us away. I had flown with Davy Adams some. He had been there about six months, but with Michael, I hadn't flown with him that much. He hadn't been there a long time, and a lot of times you fly with certain pilots. And because I was stepping onto somebody's aircraft, I had never really flown that much with Michael. 
I didn't know Michael that well. Davey was a, I'm gonna say a happy-go-lucky guy. I mean, he was, he was like everybody else. He was there. He was trying to get home safely. But he was also the type of person, if somebody's in trouble, he's gonna be out there trying to help them. Quite honestly, I felt that way with any pilot. And if any door gunner or crew chief had jumped on my aircraft, I felt comfortable with them. You get a bond with your people knowing that they're gonna do everything to save, keep you out of trouble. And I guess you feel that way about them. You're going to do whatever you can to help them. I only had about three weeks to go in country after being there all that time. But uh, that's a day I'll never forget. I'll never forget the people that were in the air. Because without them, Tom and I wouldn't have got out. When you had a scramble and you knew they were already in contact, you knew you were going to get shot at, the uh, pucker factor went up high at times uh, when you knew there was shooting going on. And you uh, come across uh, uh, a camp with uh, helmets and uh, uh, gear on the ground and you know that something's going to hit the fan at any second. When we would get into combat, uh, sometimes a crew chief would say, Mr. Bookout, Mr. Bookout, we're picking up a high freak vibration back here. Well, my feet were just shaking back and forth on the pedals, but the top half of me was totally calm. I was seeing things in slow motion. I had plenty of time to pass judgment on something, to shoot the guns over here, shoot the guns over there. Um, it was just in slow motion, but my feet were just going like this. I was, I was excited, I was scared, whatever you want to call it. It was like, I was two people at one time. I was so addicted to that adrenaline rush that <clears throat> that was it. You know, that's, that's a hard act to follow. Once you're in a contact, when you see rounds coming towards you or you hear the kicks in the aircraft as they're hitting, you get an adrenaline dump. Uh, you get tunnel vision. You focus on your target as best you can see it because it was all nighttime, and all you could do is follow the traces up and try to return more than they than they put up to you. Uh, but you never get scared. You never had any fear whatsoever uh, because you never think it's going to happen to you. You never think you're going to get shot. You think it'll happen to somebody else. Uh, but the contact uh, it was a rush. It was an absolute high uh, because so many things were happening all at one time, the guns, the smoke, the people yelling and whatnot. He's running. Da, da, da. It was just a, it was a wonderful time. It really was. Well, I think at, at the time, I think you're too busy doing your job to be scared. Uh, I don't ever remember being scared uh, during a mission. I remember being scared coming back in, thinking about what could have happened. The adrenaline high, I guess you would call it, of actually shooting at someone who's shooting at you. It's exhilarating, but very addictive, where you think, you know, man, you know, next time we get, you know, I can't, you go out on a mission and nothing happens, you're let down. You come back and you're almost depressed. We wanted to be in combat. I mean, a lot of guys said we were crazy, and I didn't think we were crazy. That was the mission. I mean, and we loved doing it, you know, so. You know, you couldn't get enough, you know. You didn't want to fly 20 hours straight, but you just couldn't get enough of them good missions, you know, the good shoot 'em ups and it was, yeah, it was awesome. Awesome. The Nighthawk mission was probably one of the, without a doubt, the most dangerous type mission. You're flying 100 feet above the ground, very, very slow, just above effective translational lift. 
It's dark everywhere, and you have this huge light. It's a perfect target at night. But that was our job. Our job was to draw fire. It really built this bond of trust uh, in your in your gunships when they're flying cover for you and you're in the light ship, working the light ship that night. The Nighthawk was to find enemy activity out in uh, different areas. We'd fly four missions a night and uh, would go out, uh, pick up uh, Vietnamese and American advisors to fly with the light ship. The light ship was boring. If you were in the right seat as a co-pilot in the light ship, everybody's looking at the left side where all the light is and all the action is, and you're sitting on the right side looking in the dark and scared to death. Uh, you don't know who's out there because all the focus is on the left side of the ship. Hey, my guys, got a bunker down here somewhere. Two or three up. And three zero's got a right mini again. And I'll be coming up to more right. We were a hunter-killer team, and we were trying to draw fire and trying to uh, spot where there had been movement. We tried not to just fly a straight pattern. We were always changing directions and uh, accelerating and slowing down and trying not to give them a really good target. The part that bothered me was going into the same places often. You know, we wouldn't have the same mission every night to the same place, but during a week, we would always go back to the same uh, little pad. Never enjoyed going into, because uh, if I was a, a Viet Cong, I'd be there waiting. So I flew a, some Nighthawk missions, and uh, it was fun, but it was kind of dumb sitting up there with a... <laughs> A spotlight saying, here I am, shoot me. You kind of drawed up a little bit uh, because you could see them tracers coming up at you, but that was our purpose, this draw fire. Uh, so that gun team above us could move in and wipe them out. Uh, that was the purpose of it. Of course, we had firepower on that uh, light ship. We had a minigun and, and machine guns and M79s and I think so we was able to protect ourselves. During the first tour in Vietnam, I was there for about eight or nine months. I don't remember exactly. And then I went back to Vietnam on a second tour and I was with the Razorbacks for about three months. But the other three months, a whole different story. The world had changed. When I first joined the Razorbacks, and then it was in December of 1969, if they fired at you, you they were a target at that point. Uh, as time went on, uh, the rules did change during the time when the Vietnamization of the war started to happen, and more, uh, you know, the, the Vietnamese were taking over a lot of the missions. Most of the American personnel uh, on the ground that were there when I arrived, by the time I left, they had gone. They were only South Vietnamese uh, on, on the ground in contacts. And probably about four months, five months into my tour, we had a back seat that would fly with us on missions, uh, usually a South Vietnamese soldier. Uh, and he would have a radio in the back. And if we found someone in contact, uh, we could not shoot. We could not engage until he was able to call up to his headquarters in Saigon, give them the grid coordinate where we were to make sure they weren't friendly troops in the area or whatnot before we could engage. So the rules tightened up as we got there. We were actually told we were, had to take a hit to t return instant fire. A hit meaning hitting the ship or a wound in and uh, it just, it didn't sit right with us. It was getting, extremely frustrating. We'd find targets and we knew it was Viet Cong and, uh, and call in and have to go through the channels here and find what district it is and we would get uh, crazy answers back that oh, no, they're, they're just moving rice, they couldn't get it done during the day, but not likely, not likely. So there were times that out of frustration we just end the mission and go home. There was no reason to stay out there and stick yourself and put yourself in harm's way. When you found the enemy you couldn't take them.
we used to have to have a back seat fly with us uh, on our missions. And uh, we was going in to pick our back seat up, but that was probably the closest time that I ever got came to getting shot down. We got shot at a lot, and we took rounds a lot. But this particular night, we was almost on the ground, and we started receiving heavy fire. We had to black out and bank out. We knew where the fire was coming from, but we had to abort the mission that night because of where the area was we couldn't fire into. And we had the firepower to take care of the situation. We couldn't use it. We ran into things at night where we were doing uh, Nighthawk missions and you would come upon people out at night in the middle of an area where they shouldn't be and the back seats for the Vietnamese and stuff would say, oh no, they're farmers or they're out here doing this or that or the other. Uh, they're dressed in black pajamas and they're, they're out in an area where there's no farmer going on. They're on a canal, you know, or, or something. We were there to do a mission and we basically kind of got handcuffed almost towards the end of it. You were, it was so restricted on things that you, you really couldn't effectively do your job that you were there to do. I had one incident. Uh, we were scrambled out of Nabe, which we had to fly across the river. We took off. We had a very short landing area. And uh, as we approached the opposite side of the river, we started taking fire from the 8 o'clock position. And I was sitting in the left door, and that's right on my door. And, Tracers were coming up on the ship. I had just locked in my barrel into the M60 as we were going across the river. And it was just natural instinct uh, to return fire. It was, it was way too close. They were probably within three feet, the tracers. And I just instantly cut loose on it. And we actually had words when we got back to base and that we were bumping chest toe to toe and throwing our helmets on the ground that he said, you know, you jeopardize everything by not getting permission to fire. I said, well, it was instinctive. And I said, it was too close. Uh, just instinctively cut loose and suppressed the fire. We rolled, banked out of the right, and uh, we never did get permission to fire on that target. But they just about took took us out. Everybody was a little getting a little bit scared in Vietnam for fear that you know you didn't want a civilian casualty, and, and we know it's war. And civilian ca casualties occur. Nobody wants to be the one responsible for that, uh, and so everybody was running scared. Got got the pilots scared, got the you know, career officers scared, you know, that we were going to make a mistake, do something wrong, and their careers are on the line, and it was, it was, it was a hard time in Vietnam when that, that occurred, because you knew you were going into hostile territory, and you had to wait, hey, you know, take a hit, take a hit in a helicopter. One, one hit can bring you down. Razorbacks were an incredible outfit. And uh, basically, 10 months into my tour, I extended. And so I uh, flew another two months when I got back and the Razorbacks stood down. So we, I, I was uh, the final chapter, you might say, uh, with the Razorbacks. We didn't get a lot of news uh, back then. Uh, about the overall picture of the war and what was going on. Uh, I remember when I first got there, when you needed bullets and gas, you could get them anywhere. Literally, Bearcat, uh, Zeon, Lake, um, uh, Tay Men, uh, down south. One day it just dawned on us, we couldn't get bullets and gas <laughs> hardly any place. The, the Razorbacks, uh, were stood down just uh, basically uh, because the mission had changed where there were 500,000 troops when I got there and it was down to 50,000. I know the last day when, when I flew out to go to Long Bend to, be this, to go back to the States, I cried. I was watching my my buddies. They're rearming and getting ready to go back out. And I thought, I want to get this helicopter. I know I'm going back home. I'm going to get discharged. I won't have to be back in this mess anymore. But you just didn't want to leave your friends because that was family. Our unit was 
exceptionally close and um, there was a lot of respect both for the men and the officers. Um, we didn't stand on a lot of ceremony, but we, but we, we got the job done. We were really very, very close. We were all young teenagers, you know, young 20, 21 years old and uh, didn't want to leave anyone behind. That's why I think most of us kept extending, you know, for another tour or whatever, just, just to stay together. They loved one another. I don't know where this came from. They were unto themselves. They didn't need anybody else's company. They had total respect for each other. And if you've ever been in the military, you know how rare that is. And they would lay down their life for, for anyone else in that unit. Anytime you've got a lot of competent people, there's some that just kind of rise above the competency level, just you know, a little bit, you know, they just a little bit extra, a little bit finer tuned. I enjoyed being around people like that, you know. They were a little bit better than anybody else, made you want to work a little bit harder so you can come up to their standards, you know. And I got some good guidance from Sergeant Powers, who was our, was our flight sergeant, and uh, he slowed me down a lot because I was pretty much a loose cannon. In my free time, there was no telling what kind of shenanigans I was going to get into, you know, whether it was partying and up to something or doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing. And he would lean on me. He was kind of, I would actually say, he was a good father figure for me over there. And there's some of us young guys, we needed a little guidance. <laughs> we needed some guidance, there's no doubt about it. He'd ground me for a while. I'd be scrubbing helicopters on the wash rack. You're going to the wash rack and clean these ships up, going into maintenance. And I would get on everybody, gotta get me back flying, gotta get me back flying. And uh, uh, he taught me to take responsibility for myself. Guys don't get to know you until they get to know you that you stink. You stink sometimes, and so does he. But even though he's got bad bodily odor, you know that you got bad bodily odor and all that, but after a while, since you're all together in the same effort, there's no mention of that. You know, everybody smells the same. The friendship you make in a situation like that with people that you would have nothing in common with uh, is probably the strongest friendship that you ever can make. I don't know how it would be, you know, but from the first time we've uh, met, it's it's been outstanding and uh, a lot, a lot more yet uh, to come to. Uh, uh, we want to see each other, you know, right up to the end. My feelings about about uh, whether it's Vietnam or any other type of combat, you know, the heroes, if you will, are people that are that are seen doing their jobs. We had people in the Razorbacks at the time that I was there that uh, I don't remember ever remember anybody not doing their job. The way things turned out in Vietnam does not make me happy. I think we left the people of Vietnam down. You know, you go through combat experience and traveling to different parts of the world, it, uh, it broadens your whole horizons, it really does. And uh, The only thing that bothers me about my military experience, the Vietnam thing, and when the, I listen to a, somebody say, well, that's the war that we lost, and uh, we didn't lose that war. I know the Razorbacks never lost a battle, and uh, the troops, the American soldiers, did not lose that war. After I got back and how the war ended and all of that, uh, it was quite a letdown. I really didn't like how the war went. I just felt like a lot of what we did over there, the lives and stuff that were lost, were just so much wasted. We didn't follow through with what we did. It, it left a sour taste in my mouth. I think it still does. Another thing that really bothered me about it was how we were treated when we came home, you know. Uh, I didn't expect a band or anything like that, but by the same token, I didn't expect to be protested and spit at and, and that kind of stuff. We just weren't treated right when, when it came back. 
I just didn't like the general public's view of things and just how it ended. It just didn't end right. You look back on yourself as whether or not uh, what you did in the war was right, you know, taking another man's life. But it is war. I can't look at anything that I would have wanted to do different. In a lot of ways, when you, when you leave there and you go home, you don't really realize it at first, but all you saw and all you had to do, and all, I mean, the number of people that you killed as a, as a unit and individually, I think it puts a callus on your soul. You're just a whole lot more insensitive to things. Some people really have a lot of problems with what happened and what they did, but I really haven't. I just, uh, I just put it all behind me. I asked for it, I volunteered. It was a big adventure to me. And maybe that sounds bad, but that's the way it was. We accomplished our mission very well. Uh, Vietnam was a barometer by which I measured my life. I've had no other friendships, no other uh, organizations ever that compared uh, to what we had in Vietnam because we're all in the same boat. Uh, you become close with your, your, your troops. I don't have any regrets, regrets about it. I didn't invent the war. I didn't want to go. <laughs> they drafted me. <laughs> but when I got over there and I got in a pretty good position, and I thought, well, I'll just hang around a while and see what's going to happen. War is extremely romantic. Uh, war is everything a person wants when you have that. It's that, that high that's higher than anything. It's just, you know, knowing that it's not that you killed people, it's the fact that you lived. You made it through and you helped others make it through. Got home and I was sitting eating, eating lunch and at home and I realized, you know, 24 hours ago I was in a hot firefight. And here I am 24 hours later sitting at home. And I don't recommend that because there's no cool down. The Razorbacks accomplished their mission. Uh, we never missed a mission. And uh, overall on Vietnam, now I thought we went in there to win that, but uh, as it turned out, that wasn't a, a thing. Uh, it was a political war, and Washington can't fight a war. And uh, they're the ones, that, uh, we didn't lose it. Washington lost it.
I had become acquainted with Chad Payne in 1967. I was flying as a crew member with the Air Force Rescue Operations out of Tonsonute Air Base in the HH-43B helicopters. A C-47 had crashed north of the Saigon River, and when we arrived at the crash scene, there were three survivors. We put them on stretchers and loaded them in the back of our helicopter, leaving only room for the medic. Another crew member and myself stayed on the ground, armed with only two M-16s and a box of ammo. Shortly after our helicopter took off, we got into an altercation with a nearby VC village. Moments later, two army gunships appeared over the tree line and flew cover for us until we were extracted by our rescue outfit when they returned. I asked the pilot who he had called, and he told me he had radioed the Razorbacks to cover us. Upon returning to base, I called the Razorback alert quarters to thank them, and Chad Payne, the platoon leader, invited me down for coffee the next morning. I became friends with the Razorbacks after that and flew occasional missions with them. Flying with the Razorbacks shortly after Ted of 68, we were shot down while covering two other helicopters that had been shot down. Chad Payne flew cover for us until he was able to use up his fuel and rockets enough to land and get us out. Chad was a unique pilot. I've known two in my 30 years of flying experience that could uh, operate on the edge all the time and knew where he was on the edge. Chad gave me a little orientation on the Razorbacks and their mission and what they, what they did. And he said, the first few missions, I want you to fly with me. And I said, that'd be fine. So he put me in the left seat. And I remember the, one of the first missions. When he made his first pass into, into this place to fire rockets into, the, into this thing, he uh, rolled that thing down on its nose, and, and the first thing I felt was I was hanging by the shoulder strap, and we were headed straight to the ground. And I'd never been in that angle of attack in, in a helicopter in my life. And by that time, I'd already had a previous tour in Vietnam, and so I wasn't a new guy on the block. Uh, the next thing I remember was this 51 millimeter uh, round coming up and the tracers coming up there. Uh, they were at least as big as a football uh, coming up at us. And, and I mean, they all looked like they were coming right square between your eyes. And there was no doubt in your mind that that guy knew that you were there and he had you pinned down. Chad Payne understood Huey gunships, everything about them. I don't personally think there's ever been a better pilot that ever strapped into one. but. Also, he could scare you to death. That was part of the adrenaline rush. Hueys are not designed to make extremely steep dive angles into the target, but Chad did. And his theory was it was easier to hit the target. And he got up so much airspeed that we'd lose translational lift and that ship would start shaking. And if you ever heard an old John Deere tractor with that big flywheel, it started making a noise real similar to that and shuddering and shaking and Chad would fly so close to the target, but he would break off at the last second. And there's been more than once that I thought he had target fixation and was gonna fly us right into the, right into the target, a bunker or a building or whatever. And he'd pull out at the last second with that thing shaking and shuddering. And I'd look over there at the crew chief and he'd look at me and just shake his head. And all my experiences as a, as a grunt in the infantry and what time I spent in gunships, I've never met a braver man he never backed off from anything. No matter what the odds were, or like during Tet, he's the one that kept everybody focused. I mean, it was really a desperate situation for about three days. We were outnumbered. Uh, there, there, were, there, were, there were probably 4,000 NVA and Viet Cong and, and all that attacked Tonsonut and Saigon and Cholon. He kept us all focused. Uh, he, he, he rallied us uh, when he knew we were tired and we had to sleep for 48 hours. He would keep us up. And, and it, just his bravery into flying into all this ground fire and flying in so close to make, make sure he, he got the target and knocked it out. I mean, he made us more than we ever could have been without him. I think what most people liked about Chet is he was very aggressive in, in his combat role. As a gun pilot, he was very aggressive. And so you go out and go out and fly with Chad, you felt like you, to, as a fire team leader, you felt like you were doing something. 
you try to teach you something new every day. You make you try to expand your mind more than concentrate on what, you know, like you're working on a helicopter. He comes up and says, you know what they call a longhorn? I says, no, sir, a bonehead. And then he tapped me on the head and says, quit being a bonehead. Now, what the hell is that supposed to mean, sir? Just think about it for a while. So you're out there flying around, you know, and what the heck? And then all of a sudden it dawned on you, you know, you did something that you should have known you shouldn't have done. You're being a bonehead, you know, and just things like that. And uh, the other officers pretty much were the same way. And when he left, there just wasn't the cohesiveness of the unit because he, he kept that unit together. I mean, he, he, had, he knew how to get the most out of you and still make you feel good. But if you screwed up, he lets you know, I mean, right now, and with both feet. And that, that's respect. And I guess that's the proper term for everything. You know, we respected each other. I've talked to several guys, you know, over the years that, that said they'd never had that in their unit. You know, the pilots were the pilots and they, they thought they were gods and we were the peons. But in our unit, no, it wasn't that way. <laughs>